contradictions in the Bible, what God revealed to me about the permanence of the earth. Walk up to me or I'll walk to you and we could both talk all about the truth. Here's the alleged contradiction. Ecclesiastes 1, 4. One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Versus 2 Peter 3, 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. I have to be honest, when I first read this one, I thought, but I asked the Holy Spirit to help me to understand. And he did! It is real. And this book, the Bible, is exciting and amazing and alive. If you'd like it to be alive for you, revelational for you, then ask him for it. Pray for it. I can promise you that is a prayer he will answer. The Holy Spirit nudged me to go to the beginning of the book. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Did you catch that? I don't know how many times I've read this before, but for some reason, I guess because I asked him, <laughs> the Holy Spirit revealed something to me. Let's look at it again, and I'm going to put some special emphasis on it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he already did it. He's created it. The earth was without form and void. So the earth existed even though it had no form and was void. What did that look like? In Genesis 1-2, it speaks of the earth and then says how the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the earth existed, had no form, was void of anything in it or on it, but somehow water's involved. Fascinating. Wait, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Oh my goodness, this is the Holy Trinity right here. God creating, the Spirit of God hovering, but where's Jesus? You look at John 4.10. Living water is described as coming from Jesus. John 7, 37 through 38 says, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So let's look at Genesis 1, 2 again. The spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Jesus is the waters. It's also interesting how as you continue on in Genesis, the first thing out of God's mouth is, let there be light. You know, God is often associated with light. When you think about James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift come from the Father of lights. Did you know that science has now proven that there's a flash of light at conception? I'm gonna go ahead and stick the link down in the description and you can find out for yourself. For me, that's proof that each one of us come out of the Father, a little bit of his spirit, that he then knits together in our mother's wombs and a great flash of light comes as he knits us together. Even though we're without form at that early stage, we're still alive and we come from the Father because every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. God is the creator, so earth was his idea. Jesus is associated with water a lot. He's the rock of the Old Testament of which the water flows out of. The Holy Spirit is cloud or fire, as we read about when the Israelites were led out of captivity from Egypt. So that's the natural representation of the Holy Spirit. Water is a natural representation of Jesus, and light can be a natural representation of the Father. Okay, so let's go back and look at the earth. <laughs> so if everything that God creates is good and perfect, then just like with us, he puts a piece of himself in everything that he creates. I know we like to think logically and have everything fit inside a box. If it doesn't fit in this box, then I don't want it. 
But we've got to remember, he's a big God. Big God. We've got to stop trying to fit him in the box. Oh dear sweet baby Jesus, I'm going to keep you inside my little box. That's all I want right here, this little box. Dear sweet baby Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says we only see in part. So what am I saying here? Yeah, what are you saying here? If the earth existed before it had any form, before it was filled with anything in it or on it, then it existed in a way that is beyond what we can see or experience right now. There is something we don't understand about time and space. We think that time is linear. But what if it's not? Actually, Einstein's theory of relativity says the faster you go, the more time slows down. Explain that to me. Here's where I start geeking out. Wormholes, portals, and all kinds of stuff. If the Earth can exist in a state where it had no form and didn't have anything in it or on it, but yet still existed, then it's beyond what we would see or experience right now. It's beyond what we would know. Okay, my brain hurts. Let's switch gears. Let's go ahead and look at what the Bible says the new Earth is like. Isaiah 65, 17. Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Isaiah 66, 22. As surely as my new heavens and earth will remain, so will you always be my people with a name that will never disappear, says the Lord. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Revelation 21, 4 through 5. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And I began to think on the words, passed away. That phrase, passed away, is used frequently in the verses that we just read. I asked my husband, who is a very logical and analytically minded engineer, if I passed away, would I cease to exist for him? And he paused, but then he said, no, no, passing away wouldn't mean that I ceased to exist. I would live in his heart, his memory, there would be some type of remains, a grave site, perhaps, or an urn with ashes in it. My spirit would have to go somewhere. And for those of us who believe in Jesus, it would be in heaven. And there I would exist. And then I realized the same terminology that's used to describe the earth passing away and becoming new is what's used about us. Second Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 1 Corinthians 15, 52-54 For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When we meet Jesus in the sky, it will be with our glorified body. All that is corruptible will be replaced by incorruption. Everything that was mortal or subject to death will be no more. Though we will no longer wear our corruptible flesh suits, we will still be us. We will still recognize each other, just in our glorified states. So in this manner, we can look at the permanence of the earth. We learned in Genesis 1 that the earth came from Creator God, with the waters of Jesus flowing through it, and the Spirit of God hovering over it. Sounds pretty special to me. The earth is something that God said existed before it had any form or was full of all the things as we would know it. Therefore, when the corruptible things of the earth melt away or are burned away, as 2 Peter 3.10 says, it doesn't mean that it ceases to exist or abide forever, as Ecclesiastes 1.4 says. We will still recognize it as earth, though it be new. When the Lord Jesus returns to the earth, Everything that is corruptible or corrupted will receive its harvest or pass away. But the incorruptible, the eternal things, will continue on forever. I won't pretend to understand it all or even know what it will look like. But I do know it will be good 
and will recognize it. Job 38, one through five. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? See, leading up to that, we all know the story of Job going through so much. But what we fail to realize or recognize is that Job was so busy defending himself and justifying himself that he missed out on justifying God. His own counsel was darkened by a lack of knowledge. So the Lord begins to question him. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Here we find some holy sarcasm. <laughs> the Lord is correcting him here in love, but also as almighty God. I wanted to read you those verses because Job, who was an upright man, the Bible says so, he had darkened counsel because of a lack of knowledge. And so the Lord filled him in on the things that he didn't know. And so if you learn one thing from this video, it is that we do not know it all. <laughs> so the next time you hear someone say, or you read how the Bible has contradictions in it, don't believe it. We do not know it all. Our lack of knowledge is severe. <laughs> but the Lord God knows it all. He is perfect in knowledge, as Job 37, 16 says. So we can get to know the Lord, and he's the one who gives us the wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So there you go. That's where it starts. The beginning of knowledge is fearing the Lord looking at him reverently, knowing that he is above all, that he knows all, and we don't. 1 Peter 1, 20. He, Jesus, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you. It seems to me that God doesn't wear a watch, but he does have an event timeline. And he does have perfect knowledge. And before the world was ever even created, he knew Jesus Christ would be the ransom for it. Before the earth ever had any living thing upon it, the Lord called it earth. So even when everything corruptible in it and on it melts away like wax, the earth will exist as God intends it to, that he will make it new and make it in its glorified state just as we will be. And we will recognize it. God is not so limited by our timelines and our concepts of space and matter. When we get to heaven one day, I truly believe we'll be able to go to that moment in time when the earth was created and watch it happen. But let us see. I can't prove this one to you with science or even knowledge because we all see in part right now. We only know what he reveals and he reveals things in his mercy, not because he has to. But I believe his word is true and I encourage you to do the same. There may be things that we don't understand in our limited mindset and the limitations of what we naturally see. But there's so many things outside of that, in the spirit realm, that exist and will exist forever. The cross. The Lord reminded me of the cross as I was doing this video. And I can see it now again. He wants me to tell you about the cross. The cross will never cease to exist. It was before the foundation of the earth. It was when Jesus naturally in his body bore our collective sin and shame on it. 
to die for each one of us. And it still is a reminder of the completed work that he's done. The blood that he poured out on the mercy seat once and for all for us. But it never ceases to exist. And neither does the earth. The earth is a part of God. And it will abide forever in whatever state, fashion, or form that God says it does. <laughs> That's awesome. If you, if you want to talk it up, or you want to talk about peace, then please, by all means, strike up some conversation with me.